Let's continue. Um, the Hebrew Bible has three groups of books, and I remind you of the arrangement. English Bible, four groups of books. But I'm interested in the Hebrew Bible now. You have the law, the Torah. Now notice, law in, not in a narrow sense, Torah is, law is teaching in a broad sense. Then you have the prophets, the Nevi'im. Um, since you're doing Hebrew, a prophet is a Navi. This is the plural of that, which is Okay, Nevi'im. Yep. Right? You like the plural? So, nev Navi, prophets, Nevi'im, plural. Torah, like that. <coughs> and that comes from Yara, which is to coach, train, teach in a practical kind of a way. Torah is coaching, training, teaching, uh, practical kind of teaching, instruction. It comes from the verbal root. I know that's the verbal root. I don't know if you've got that abbreviation, learnt that yet in Hebrew. Okay. I just know the math. You know. Well, this is yes. Yara. Uh, okay, it's a noun from that. Uh, it's usually. Have you had hifil form? Well, Hifil no, thing? Okay, okay. This comes from the Hifil of that Torah. Okay, now the th uh, notice that the prophets, there are two groups of them. There's the former prophets, okay. historical books, and then there are the latter prophets. And in the latter prophets, we have four scrolls the Isaiah scroll, Jeremiah scroll, Ezekiel scroll, and then you have the 12. And we've just done the last of those 12. The 12, it's called in the Hebrew Bible. And then you get the third category, um, which has two different names. Sometimes it's called Psalms. Why Psalms? Because it's the first book. It's the first book. It's the first name. And that's a ancient tradition. You name a book after its beginning. So it's either Psalms or it's called the Writings. Um, that sort of actually easy? Have you had this verb, Kathav? which is to write. Yeah. Kethuv is the one for today. Kathuv is something written from Kathav and then the plural of that is Kethuvim. Kethuvim, writings, scriptures. Now, notice the books we have here and look for the unexpected, the Kleinic principle. Um, first of all, which book is out of place here? Well, only one of them. Well, there's a number. We'll just, I'll, just go, I'll just go through them. First we have Psalms, then Proverbs, then Job, and then you get what are called the five festal scrolls. Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, then Daniel, and then uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, together, and First and Second Chronicles. What's out of place here? I can see sort of three things. Okay, good. Daniel. Daniel's obviously out of place because it, it, you'd expect it to be with the prophets. prophets. Yep. Yep. Uh, Lamentations is part of Jeremiah. Right. Oh, yes. And First and Second Chronicles seems. You know, it seems very former history type thing. Yeah. Right. And the same with Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah and even Esther's also history. No, that's true, it is, yeah. Then Ruth is history. Ruth is not really history, it's a story yeah. about a woman. Um, but notice here that there's there's some something funny going on here. Um, it looks like a bit of a grab bag of stuff. You can see, you can see, you can see why this is one collection, you can see why this is one collection, but what's basically at work here? Okay, just look for, uh, no, 
learning to be a scholar and a good Bible reader, a good exegete, but also a good preacher, is learning to ask questions. And the most important question you ever ask is why? Why, why, why? Not only of scriptures, but when you're dealing with people. Don't ask the question what, but why? All the time, why? That's the basic stance you need to have. Why, why, why? Why do people behave that way? Why do people say that? Why does this book come after that book? Why is this unit before this unit? Um, why is this emphasized here? Okay, why? Now, um, that's the most important question you asked, and it's, it's, uh, you probably know from maths and other things you studied, um, that you won't be able to get the answer right until you get the question, question right. Yeah, right. And so if you're writing an essay, get the question right, yeah. and then you'll get the answer. If you want to make sense of something, you are, you've got to ask the right question before you can make sense of it. Right? right? And, and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> becoming a theologian means asking theological questions, questions about God, and the right questions about God. Uh, now, let's have a look at, and I'd like to explain, um, this category here, the writings. Okay, um, now, um, four obvious things. Number one, this third group of, in the Hebrew Bible is called writings. It's a general name. It doesn't really tell you very much. Whereas Torah is very uh, helpful and prophets, yeah, uh, prophets, but writings is a, doesn't give you any idea. Yes. But um, now, here's the cl clue number one. This third category of books seems to have been influenced by the notion of inspired wisdom, which you find in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18. Um, that's around about 600 BC. The people there generally re recognize that God's word comes to them in three different ways. You've got it there, please. Dylan, read Jeremiah 18, verse 18 for me, please. They said, Come, let's make plans against Jeremiah. For the teaching of the law by the priest will not be lost, nor the counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. Right, oh, you get God's word coming in three ways. There's the law, which is taught by who? priests, and then there's the word which is taught by the prophets, Pro no, the word, and then there's counsel, which means what? Advice, wisdom, wise, wisdom, advice, counsel, all the same thing, um, taught by which people? Elders. elders. Now, elders aren't old people, elders are what? Oh, I mean, wise. Wise. <laughs> wise. wise. They are... Uh, uh, the, an elder in an Aboriginal community is not just an old people, not everybody who's old is an elder, an elder is a wise leader. So it's a leader, but it's a leader not because of position, you know, like uh, in government, or being ordained or something like that, but a leader who has a position of leadership because they're recognized as being experienced and wise. And this usually means that they have lived a few years. Yep. Um, so, so, yes, they are old. Actually, the term elder in Hebrew... Okay. 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 okay, do you know what zakain means literally? And we don't have... Oh, yes, we've got two uh, possible uh, zekanim here. <coughs> I'm going to go defer to you. Oh, I had one yesterday, I suppose. Uh, not today. Uh, Zakain means a person with a beard. Really? Ah, nice. Yes, and oh, so it means a mature, a mature male. So it's not so much yeah. old, but a mature Someone male. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean anything. Beard. Sorry, what? Someone who can grow a beard, not looking at girls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't grow a beard. Uh, also, somebody who should not grow a beard. There's some who should not grow beards. Some who could be wise in making those Okay. Very, very true. 
Now, um, okay, of these books, um, if you think of the Old Testament as a canon of books, you know what canon, the, a list of books that are to be used in worship, um, the category that was agreed on and closed first of all was the law. And then basically, um, uh, the next one, the prophets, was fairly soon after in the exilic period. Um, except for the last few prophets like Malachi. So the, uh, the law was basically finalized by the time of, let's say, Josiah, or you know, around about 600 BC, the books of the law. <coughs> the prophets were basically finalized after the last prophet, which is Malachi, somewhere between 300 to, we know it's the latest possible date could be 200. No, there was final decisions about which books should be there or not there. Um, but even at the time of Jesus, the listing of books in the writings had not yet been settled once and for all. Okay. Um, so the canonical status of the books in the writings was settled uh, by the rabbis round about 90 AD, 30 years after the death of Jesus, in a very famous council of Jumnia, which is in present uh, Jumnia up at north, close to the Sea of Galilee, close to uh, uh, Nazareth, uh, not Nazareth, Capernaum, Council of Jamnia. Uh, now, there were, uh, uh, the, they finally, there was agreement that most of the books in what's now the Apocrypha, remember the Apocrypha? Um, were already by that stage had been decided about, but there were two books um, that there was great dispute about. Okay. And the two books were Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. Ecclesiastes, because if you take particular passages of Ecclesiastes out of their context, it seems to contradict what is said elsewhere in the Old Testament and even elsewhere in Ecclesiastes. Oh. Right? So it's, it's, it's dangerous to use this out of context. Because the way Ecclesiastes arguments argues is the following. It, you, he collects proverbs and puts one proverb on the one hand people say this, on the other hand people say that, but I say this. But he doesn't say on the one hand this, on the one hand that, but I say this. He merely puts this and this and this next to each other. Uh. And you, get, you, you don't understand him if you say what he's saying is the, either the first or the second rather than the third part of the argument. Can you see the way he works? Yep. So um, that wasn't so... Uh, uh, contentious as the Song of Songs. What's the problem with the Song of Songs? It's R-rated. Yeah. What? R-rated. R-rated. It's, it's, yes, and uh, it's hyper R-rated for the ancient world. Why is it R-rated? Um, because it describes sex. Because it describes sex. But it does it, it in a way that sex was, has been described in all societies basically until modern times and that's euphemistically, indirectly, indirectly. Um, I'll give you a, 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 an American euf euphemism. You go to America and people will ask you, or Americans come to Australia and they ask, where's the washroom? <laughs> Meaning, where's the? Oh, toilet. 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 Yeah. They will never use the word toilet. No. Let alone crap house or something like that. <laughs> uh, so even toilet is a euphemism, um, but uh, wash house is a very strong euphemism. No, uh, euphemism mean uh, feminism is a saying. You is a um, a, good, a polite way of saying things, a good way of saying something. So, you do it indirectly, yes. So, so you mean that when it refers to fawns, it's not actually talking about fair animals? <laughs> okay. You, you, I, he's, he's very literal, this guy. He's a scientist. He's a computer man. Now, I want him to go back and to reread the whole thing and see if he gets the hang of it. He's a, you're a married man, so you should be able to decipher the symbolism. Now, um, it's not just... 
the problem with Song of Songs is not just that it's basically, on the face of it, is erotic literature, erotic poetry, meaning it's about sex. Um, but there's a, an additional problem, is that the name of God isn't mentioned once. There's one place where there is an allusion to the name of God, but God is never named. No? Um, now, uh, you can see then why people argue that it shouldn't be included. Um, the question that we will be asking when we do look at it closely is why was it included? Um, and basically it was included, if I give you part of the answer, because it was recognised that this was wisdom literature that had to do with the getting of wisdom. Now we'd have to do some work on uh, that uh, before that makes sense. Yeah. Um, number four, the writings contain those books that were not set down for continuous reading in the synagogue. If you go to the synagogue to the present day, you'll get two readings. There is the law reading and then there's the prophets reading. But uh, on the normal Sabbath day, you don't get any readings from the writings. Uh, you'll get a psalm <coughs> that's used, and you'll get the, on five occasions, you'll get one of the festive scrolls being read. I'll have talk about that in a minute. Uh, they're on festive occasions, but they're not set for regular reading um, anywhere in the synagogues at the time of Jesus and to the present day. So you won't get a, a, the rabbi reading it, you won't get anybody preaching from the writings. You'll always get the sermon from the law, you won't get a, even a sermon from the prophets. Take note of that, because when Jesus preaches his sermon in Nazareth, he doesn't preach from the law, he preaches from the prophets. That's the first time that had ever happened in history. Absolutely um, uh, new, yes? I'm just wondering, if we were to uh, listen into a Jewish sermon, would, would the majority of things that they'd say, apart from if they were saying something about the Messiah, obviously we'd agree with? Uh, yeah, basically. Because they teach the law. They teach the Pentateuch. But it's, it's the conclusions that they draw from the law their exegesis would agree with. Okay. Um, but what would we disagree with? They'd say, you've got to keep the law. Why do you have to keep the law? So you can be right with God. And so that when, judge, when you die or when judgment day comes, what? God will recognize you as being righteous. God will recognize you as being righteous. Or um, you keep the God's law so that God will reward you in this life. I know? Half truth, but the first one is wrong. Now that's, that's the basic difference. Okay? But notice it's all about law and what you, God wants you to do. The will of God for you in your life, what you need to do, um, that's the focus of preaching in syna the synagogues and Jewish communities. By the way, it's also what's preached in most churches, sadly. Law. Yes. Uh, but not in Lutheran churches. I don't know many Lutheran churches that fall into that trap, at least in Australia. Now, the five festive scrolls, can I give them to you just broadly? Um, the first one is Song of Solomon, uh, which is that erotic stuff, which is set to be read on the Feast of Passover. Really? Passover, yes. Right, okay, well, you see, this is interesting. The second one, the Book of Ruth, is set to be read at Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, um, which is the same as ours. Lamentations is set to be read on the day of fasting that commemorates the destruction of the Second Temple. Well, okay, that fits. Yeah. That's in present day, usually it's July, August because it, the Jewish calendar is slightly different to ours, but it's almost always in, in July. Um, the lamentation for the destruction of the temple, you can see why it's uh, not connected with Jeremiah, because it's used to lament the fact that there's no temple anymore. 
Ecclesiastes is set to be read at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, uh, Passover is at the spring equinox, Tabernacles is at the autumn equinox. Autumn, it's at the end of the grape harvest, the end of the agricultural year, just before the rains that start off the new agricultural year. So they've just like they've got all their produce. Yeah. Yes, and so it's a time in which you can have a week's holiday. It's festive time. Yeah. It's like Christmas for us. Um, but for farming community, tabernacles, this is the time to do <coughs> whoopee, to have a good time, to have a holiday, to have a break, to have a good time. Yeah. Uh, Ecclesiastes. And then uh, you have the book of Esther, which is set to be read at the Feast of Purim, uh, which is usually in our February, late January or February, and that commemorates the uh, uh, sparing of God's rescue of the Jews from a pogrom in the Persian Empire. Okay, right? okay Purim. Um, and it's a time of great rejoicing. It's a time which should, you know, if, if we were Jews here in Australia, would be the most popular festival because it's the obligation of every male <coughs> to drink so much alcohol that he doesn't know the difference between Mordecai and Harman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I like that one. <laughs> uh, license to have a good time. Now, five festive scrolls. Why are they called festive or festal scrolls, Stephen? Because they use them for their... Uh, On those festive occasions. Yeah. Why does so... This is liturgical stuff. Can you see liturgical stuff? Yep. Okay, can... Uh, and uh, then... Um, uh, the strange part here... Okay, next. Now, the order of these books varies in different listings. Um, in the Palestinian tradition, rather than in the uh, Babylonian tradition, which we follow, in the Palestinian tradition, Chronicles comes first. Um, some <coughs> traditions place Job before Proverbs. Why Job before Proverbs? Because historically speaking, Job lived before David and Solomon. Okay, so... Uh, uh, the most mysterious one is the location of Daniel. Whereas in our English Bible, Daniel is among the prophets, in the Hebrew Bible, it's in the writings. Now, why is this the case? Well, it was because the book of Daniel was used by Jewish zealots around about 67 AD in the revolt against Rome. And the book of Daniel has been used ever since by people who are always predicting the end of the world and dating the end of the world. Of all the books of the Old Testament, it is the one that is abused and misinterpreted most of all. And so the rabbis quite wisely shifted it from the prophets, where it's regarded as a prophecy about what God's going to do in the future, to emphasis um, on uh, it as wisdom. So the book of Daniel is shifted from the writings after the destruction of the second temple as the result of speculation on Daniel 9, um, uh, it's regarded then, not so much as prophecy, but uh, as a book that teaches piety and wisdom. Uh, apocalyptic wisdom. Wisdom which helps you understand the working of God in human history and to understand what God's goal is in human history. So it's not so much a matter of prophecy, but a matter of understanding the way God is at work out there in the world, in human history, and what his goal is in human history. Now, there's two kinds of books here. Can we go through it and see if you can work out? What you have is a combination of two kinds of material. There's wisdom material, and there is liturgical worship material. And in some cases, the two come very close together. Let's see if you can work out which is which. Psalms. <coughs> Stephen, liturgical or wisdom? Liturgical. Liturgical. Proverbs. Dylan? Wisdom. Wisdom. Uh, Job? Wisdom. Wisdom, good. Uh, let's go to uh, next one, Song of Solomon. Tony? 
Well, I would have said wisdom. It definitely is wisdom. Uh, Ruth? Wisdom. Wisdom. Good. Lamentations? Well, I thought they were liturgical. Liturgical. Um, Ecclesiastes? Wis wisdom. Wis wisdom. Yeah, it's comparing stuff. Yep, it's definitely a wisdom text. Esther, historical, but also basically within the wisdom tradition. Daniel? Wisdom. wisdom oh yeah, well, that's the one that's odd, so we'll leave that out, out there. Ezra and Nehemiah? Liturgical, because it has to do with the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, first and second chronicles, do you know what that is? Liturgical. Liturgical, because the focus of this history is on the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Okay. So it has to do with the history of the first temple. So the focus is, it's a liturgical history. Yes. Righto. Um, notice, so, you get the combination of these two things and the theological principle that is at work here is the connection between what we would say uh, is wisdom and piety or spirituality. So, wisdom and involvement in worship. And the basic uh, uh, conviction is given in a proverb, the fear of the Lord is the beginning or foundation of wisdom. Wisdom has to do with spirituality, piety, living the spiritual life. What's the foundation for wisdom? Where do you get wisdom from? You get it from God and you get it from fearing God. How do you fear God? By, par by participating in worship. Right? So the fear of the Lord which we say worship of the Lord is the basis, the foundation, the beginning of wisdom. So wisdom and worship, to put it in modern terms. Um, the wisdom books from Proverbs through to Daniel, all of those you could say are basically wisdom texts, are framed, are bracketed by uh, Psalms and Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles to show that wisdom comes from involvement in the divine service. <laughs> Why in the divine service? Because who is the teacher of wisdom? God. God. Okay, so God teaches wisdom in the school of life. Uh, that seems to be the principle at work here. Now, any questions about this category of books? Um, yes? The, the ones that are liturgical, they make references to the temple. Is that no, um, uh, the, we're talking about First and Second Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, books that focus on the, on the temple, are, uh, their interest is basically to do with worship. Yeah. Because the temple is the place of worship. So temple and worship, worship and temple go together. Yeah. Obviously. Right? No big point, yes? I'm, I'm not sure I'm asking a question. Did Jesus say that about this is what the prophet Daniel spoke about. Or was he referring to the prophet Joel? Uh, I don't think he ever uh, refers. This is what the prophet Daniel spoke. Um, this is what it said about um, you know the uh, uh, the desolation about the end of the world. You can just go to uh, Mark chapter thirteen. Yeah, it's no doubt that Jesus regards Daniel as a prophetic book. And the Christian tradition is to hold it as a, a, a prophetic book. Um, chapter, what, chapter 13, verse um, 14. Yes, Dylan, you've got it there. Can you read? When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Right oh, uh, notice that the abomination of, that causes desolation is in quotation. If you go down the bottom there, Jesus is quoting... Daniel. Yeah. But notice he doesn't say, when you see what Daniel prophesies when he spoke about the abomination of desolation, uh, I don't know of any place where Jesus refers to names Daniel. And this is the only place where he um, quotes Daniel, except there's one term that he uses all the time which alludes to Daniel. Do you know what Jesus, term that Jesus uses for himself? 
the Son of Man. Do you remember that that's the term that Daniel uses um, uh, in very famous part of uh, chapter 7? The Son of Man. So whenever Jesus talks about himself as the Son of Man, the one to whom judgment is given, the one to whom the kingdom is given, the one who reigns together with the saints, um, uh, he's referring to the book of Daniel. But he's alluding to it, he's, he, and, but he never says, uh, I am the Son of Man, as Daniel says. Okay, now, the first of the book of writings is Psalms, just some introductory stuff. A bit of Hebrew again, since you've done enough Hebrew now that uh, uh, we can work with Hebrew. The Hebrew verb for praise is Hillel. And from that word we get hallelujah. Hillel, that's a PL form. The cull is halal. However, it's hardly ever used uh, in that form. It's usually in this PL form. So Hillel is to praise, and the noun from that is te. Uh, Tehilim, from tehila is the singular, tehilim. Now, um, we call the, uh, this book Psalms. Okay? Now, it comes from the Greek word salo. Now, you haven't had Greek, which means to pluck a stringed instrument, to pluck a lyre. So, a psalm is a song that is sung to a pluck string instrument okay. so it's, it's so and, and you need to take count of this that this basically is uh, music and poetry together so it's songs that are to be sung psalms musical uh, songs that are sung to the accompaniment of stringed instrument yeah. now um, look for the unexpected in the Hebrew Bible they're not called uh, psalms <coughs> or songs, they're called praises. So the whole book of Psalms is called the book of praises. What's funny about that? Do you know? There's a lot of lament. Right, not a lot of lament. If you add up the, the actual Psalms of praise and the Psalms of lament, there are for every one Psalm of praise you get at least two or three Psalms of Lament. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'd like you to think about that for a little bit because there's something very profound and important here. Um, so, uh, uh, the whole book is called the Book of Praises, and yet most of the Psalms are laments, complaints. In what way is, or what kind of complaining is in fact praising? It's gaining a wisdom, isn't it? No. Pain and... Oh, you're getting somewhere. I think you're on the right track. What does suffering. Um, it has something to do with uh, suffering, yeah, that pain. Suffering comes Out of that suffering comes... comes um, a greater, well, it's a greater understanding, but it's also a recognition of where God is. How do you learn to praise? Through, through suffering. Through suffering, because if every lament takes you on a journey. You begin to face your trouble... You look at your trouble and then you bring your troubles to God and every psalm of lament ends with a promise of it's a, it's a praise. So what is it that teaches you to praise paradoxically? I would expect uh, good times would teach you to praise. Mm. But what is it? Suffering. 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 Remember, Jonah learned to praise God in a strange place. In the belly of the whale. In the the belly whale. Of the whale. So... In, so um, we learn, and this is the wisdom part, we learn to praise God rightly, properly, fully through the experience of suffering. Now that's one. What? In hindsight, a lot of time. In hindsight, and it's the end, it's the goal. 
And yet, however, uh, it's deeper than that. Stephen? I was going to say, like, so much of the promise is when the people are suffering. Yes. God speaks to his people and says, then I will deliver you and you will praise my name. Yes. It's always that the goal of God's deliverance is praise. But can I put it to you something else? How is not all complaining, but complaining to God about the fact that he hasn't kept his promises, he's, uh, he hasn't dealt justly or graciously or charitably or fairly with his people, how could that be? Praise. Well, it's trust and faith in his... Number one, it's not only trust in faith in God, but in what kind of a God? A just, merciful, gracious God. So paradoxically... Acknowledging God, yeah, praise is not, not just acknowledging God, but acknowledging what about God? God's goodness. God's, God's justice and that stuff. Yeah, yeah God's yeah. goodness. So you praise God even when you yeah. lament. And maybe most clearly when you lament, because you insist on, you acknowledge God is what kind of a God? He's a good God, he's a fair God, he's a gracious God, he's a loving God, he's a merciful God. And what makes you bold enough to lament to God? Because that's what you believe. Now, this knocks on its head one of the most prevalent modern dogmas about worship, is that worship is basically a matter of being happy. Is that what we're, there's a lot of psychology the, in that. Right, yeah, we'll just leave that aside. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. uh, you go to many churches and the thing you've got to avoid at all sides is any kind of negativity. Have you come across that? Yeah. Avoidance of negativity. Uh, you can't be miserable. God asks us to be joyful. And joyful, joyful. is joyful. identified with being happy. It's not, it's a deep what? Sorry? It's a deep-seated thing, joy. Is it's, not. Joy is not happiness. Because you can be joyful even when you're very sad. Joyful, joy is a state, whereas happiness is just a fleeting emotion. Um, now, there's a place in worship for happiness, joy, but there's also a place in worship for what? Lamenting, sadness, misery, uh, being unhappy before God. Uh, being depressed in God's presence and handing your depression, your trouble. Uh, now, most of the Psalms uh, are laments. Uh, one, yeah, sorry. In that corporate worship. Yes. Am I hearing you right? Yes. I, I, I don't quite get it, but in that corporate worship, there is to be. That, that joy. That well, joy is oh, one part. Joy is so. one part of it, but it's interesting if you look at the old collection of hymns and the new collection of hymns. Go to this hymn book. There's a section here called "Cross and Comfort." Do you realise that we hardly ever sing those hymns in the church, modern times? Because they're too negative. Yeah. Um, too cross and comfort. You. You, uh, the only cross and comfort hymns that you'll get in all together connection come from one very good author, and it's Robin Mann. Yeah. Levi, it's, not, um, it's probably not actually. Cross and comfort? Page. No, it's not on the page. Okay. Oh. I'll get you the page if you. One last thing before we go, uh, and I want you to. Um, so guess, no, the arrangement of Salter. I said it's called the Book of Praises. Most of the psalms are laments. However, there's a strange way in it's arranged. In the first three, there are five books of the psalms, just as there's five books of the law. In the first three books, guess what predominates? Is laments. In the last two books, you get most of the praises. And uh, the further you get close to the end of the psalm until you get the last bracket of psalms, what are they basically? Psalms of praise. Okay. So the psalms take us a journey from lamenting through to praising. And that's the journey from earth to heaven. Because when we get to heaven, there'll be no more any lamenting. There will be able to praise without lamenting. But as long as we're here, lamenting is part of 
praising. And that's something our generation has to learn all over again. Uh, let's uh, go to chapel for the Ascension Day service this morning. <laughs>